It's great to be here with you again this week as I'm continuing to share some Bible studies that I would normally do on Wednesday evening. And uh, what we're studying there right now is we're studying lists in the Bible. And we're right in the midst of Holy Week. And so I thought this week would be great to think about the list of Jesus' last words from the cross. It's often referred to as the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. And so we're going to share that today and look at those scripture passages. What were the final things that he said uh, before his death? So let's begin with the word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity again um, to share in your word. And we ask you, Lord, to, to make your presence known with us, especially through your Holy Spirit. God, our thoughts, God, our hearts, and help us, Lord, just to remember the wonderful gift that you gave to us when your son died upon that cross. So as we talk about his last words from the, the cross, may they teach us and may they touch our hearts so that we might be better disciples. For this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is Holy Week, and it started with Palm Sunday with Jesus' triumphal entry um, into Jerusalem riding upon the donkey. Some of the Gospels tell us that later on he went into the temple and he overthrew the tables of the money changers and where they were selling animals for sacrifices. Um, the zeal of the Lord was upon him, and needless to say, that did not uh, get him into the hearts of the religious leaders who were seeking after him. During the week, then, the rest of that week, he continued to teach there at the, the temple steps. He was there every day, and many people came and, and listened to him. But again, he had confrontations with the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, who were seeking some way to arrest him um, and perhaps to put him to death, but they didn't want to do it in the midst of the crowd. And so it was Judas, one of the 12, Judas Iscariot, who said he would tell them of a private place where he would go with his disciples and they could arrest him there. And of course, uh, we know that happened Thursday evening. He had his last meal with his disciples. He initiated uh, Holy Communion. He washed their feet. Wonderful evening, they went out to the Mount of Olives and there he prayed uh, there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, that prayer, that heart-wrenching prayer, Lord, if this cup might pass for me, but not my will, but thine be done. And then he was arrested, <clears throat> led to a trial with the Sanhedrin, and then ultimately led before Pilate. And there he was condemned to death. And so now we're going to look at the words that he spoke actually after he was hung upon the cross. And uh, so the first uh, words that we want to uh, read about are found in the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. I'm going to read verses 32 through 38. Here we read, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they did not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood by watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. But his first words from the cross were, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Isn't that just amazing? The very persons who sought to kill him, to take his life, and as he hung from the cross, he asked for the Father to forgive them, that they didn't really recognize what they were doing. You know, Jesus talked a lot about forgiveness. And of course, when we say the Lord's Prayer, we ask God, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us or who trespass against us. Easy words to say, much more difficult to do. But can you imagine being executed, hanging upon the cross, the nails in your hand, the nails in your feet, hanging there, drawing your last breaths, gasping, blood pouring from the whipping he had taken, the crown of thorns upon his head, and yet he says, Father, forgive them. Oh my, what a message to us. What thoughts as we think about people who have hurt us and who have wronged us. Um, when we think about how Jesus forgave those who executed him, it teaches us how important it is for us uh, to forgive our neighbor and even perhaps those who we might call our enemies. So with these words, Jesus exemplifies love by praying that the Father would forgive even those who were going to take his life. 
Uh, the second words come again from the Gospel of Luke, following in chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Here it says that one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. He said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. And he said, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are being punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man, he has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So these are the next words of Jesus I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. Again, we see about Jesus' forgiveness, his forgiveness of this criminal upon the cross, but we also see the way to salvation in that criminal. The first thing you notice that criminal does is he confesses that, that he's done wrong. Uh, he said to the other criminal, he says, we are getting what we deserve. Um, we are guilty. I and mean, our deeds have led us to this place. All of us need to come to that point where we confess the fact we're all sinners and the wages of sin are death. We deserve this punishment. But he recognized who Jesus was. He said, Jesus is innocent. He does not deserve to die upon this cross. And because he was innocent, he was able to take their sins and all of our sins upon himself. This man has done nothing wrong and yet he is dying here upon this cross. And so he asks him to remember him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he recognizes that this is the Messiah. His kingdom is not of this world, it's of someplace else. And then Jesus gives him those words of forgiveness and those words of promise. Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's what he says to us. If we confess our sins, if we acknowledge who he is, that he died for our sins, we too will be forgiven. And we too will receive those words of promise. You will be with me in my Father's kingdom in paradise. So those were the second words that he spoke from the cross. And then looking at the third words that he spoke coming from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, verses 25 through 27. It says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple he said, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Again, isn't it amazing how Jesus is there dying upon the cross but his concern was not so much about him, his concern was about others. We saw that when he asked the Father for, to forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. His concern was for them and for what the consequences of what they had done was going to be. But now he looks upon his mother with compassion in his heart. And he also looks at his beloved disciple. He knows difficult and dark days are coming. He knew during this, uh, this time there would be a great deal of suffering and a great deal of sorrow. And they were going to need one another, to comfort one another, to encourage one another, to support one another. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we're told that he would always have compassion on the people. When they came and they brought their sick, when they came and they brought those who were lame or who were demon-possessed or who had leprosy or who were blind and they came before him, he felt compassion for them and he brought about their healing. One time, even as he entered a village, a village called Nain, there was a widow there whose son had died and he felt compassion for her because she was a widow, her husband was dead. Now with her son being dead, how was she going to survive? And we're told how he reached up his hand and he touched the... Uh, the pallet on which the man laid, and he restored him to life. Jesus felt compassion. When they gathered by the thousands and, and they were hungry after being with him all day and listening to his teaching, he felt compassion for them. He told his disciples, give them something to eat, and they didn't know how they were going to do it. And he performed the miracles of multiplying the loaves and the fish, and he fed one time 5,000, another time 4,000. 
with baskets remaining. Jesus was compassionate toward other people and even toward his own family. Now you may wonder, well, where were Jesus' brothers that we're going to read about later on and we read in the Gospels? Well, you see, they didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus at this time. So they were not there at his execution, but his mother was there. Some of his disciples were there, and when he saw John, his beloved disciple, he said, this is your mother. And to his mother, he said, this is your son. You need to become like family for these dark and difficult days that lie ahead. These are going to be difficult times, and you're going to need one another. You know, the other amazing thing that I'm reminded of here is that Jesus' brothers eventually follow him. After Easter, when they're gathered in the upper room, um, later on after his ascension, we find that Mary and his brothers are there. Why? Well, the only reason I can figure out is because they saw Jesus. They saw him after his crucifixion, that he was alive, physically resurrected. And James, his brother, became one of the leaders in the early church. So, but at this time, his mother is alone, John is there. Behold your mother. Behold your son. Jesus, again, showing compassion even for his own family as he's dying there upon the cross. And then the next words, his fourth words from the cross, we find in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. I'm going to read verses 45 through 56. And this shares a great deal about his death upon the cross. It says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And then about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and he offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And it says at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and even the tombs were open. It says the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now when the centurion and those who were with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs, and among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So remember these words that Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These, of course, are a quote from the book of Psalms. Uh, My God, my God, why have you uh, forsaken me? And Jesus cries out upon the cross. It's not so much that God forsook him, it's the fact that at this moment, All the sins of the world were resting upon Jesus. And because of that, God, who is holy, could not look upon him because he could not look upon our sin. Jesus carried that burden. Jesus carried that agony alone. Oh, how difficult it would be. But this was the only way it could happen. Unless a person who was completely innocent, a person who had not sinned, That's the only way that that debt could be paid. You see, if I said, hey, I would love to die for you, I'd be willing to go to the cross and and die for you because I love you as a brother, as a a sister. I can't do it because, you see, I too am a sinner. (laughs) I owe that penalty of death as well, as all of us. But there was one person who came into the world, Jesus He was fully human, fully divine, just like you and me, tempted as we are, yet without sin. And because he didn't have any sin, he didn't have to pay 
the consequences of that sin. I, I remember the story in the Gospel of John where they brought the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and brought her before him. And they said, Jesus, uh, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law said that uh, to take a woman like this and she used to be stoned to death. What do you say? They were trying to trip him up because they knew they weren't allowed to execute anybody, and yet they knew what the law said. So what did it say what Jesus said? And we're told at that point he began to scribble in the ground. We don't know what he wrote. But then he looked up and he says, Okay, the one of you who's without sin, you throw the first stone. And we're told that they all walked away, dropping their stones, beginning with the oldest, because they recognized, Hey, <laughs> I'm not perfect. I got sin in my own life. If that's what I have to do to cast a stone, I can't do it. And one by one, they all left until it was just Jesus and this woman alone. And he looked up and he said, where are your accusers? Is there no one here who can uh, cast a stone? Is there no one here who can uh, come before you and take your life? And I imagine she was weeping. She says, no, no one. And then Jesus said, neither do I. You see, there was one person there who was without sin who could have cast that stone and that was Jesus, because he didn't have sin. And he said to her, neither do I contemn you, but go now and sin no more. As Jesus hung upon that cross, he took all of our sins upon himself. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go. You're forgiven, but sin no more. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? the sins of the world upon his shoulders as he died there upon the cross. And then the fifth words that he said, again from the Gospel of John, uh, the 19th chapter, reading verses 28 and 29. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and they lifted it up to Jesus' lips. Jesus said, I thirst. I am thirsty. You know, so many times it's easy for us to look at Jesus as the Son of God, which he is, but we forget that he was also a human being. Just like we become hungry and we become thirsty, so did Jesus. And just like when we are struck and cut, we will bleed, we will bruise, so did Jesus. And just like if we were beaten, um, we would feel pain, so did Jesus. And Jesus, as he hung there, in these last moments, in these last minutes of his life, he said to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. I thirst. And so they lifted up this sponge of vinegar, of wine, to his lips. How very human Jesus was. He had all the needs that we have. He felt all the things that we feel. The same pain, the same anguish. And in the Psalm 69, verse 21, he fulfills this prophecy that said, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. So Jesus was human. Jesus was fully divine. He was godly. But Jesus also knew the scriptures. And to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I thirst. And now we're going to read about the last things that he spoke from the cross, the last uh, two very things that he says as he surrenders up his life. Again, in the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, the 30th verse, we find these words. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Now we know the agony of death is probably the hardest experience uh, that community that humanity struggles with to understand because you see we can only experience it secondhand through the lives of loved ones and people that we've been close to but Jesus died he experienced it so that we also might receive lives 
With these words is finished, Christ offers up his spirit, and he clearly states that his earthly ministry is over. But more than that, I also think he is saying that the consequences of sin, the victory that sin has over us, the victory that death has over us, it's now finished. With his death upon the cross, with his dying for our sins, now that penalty has been paid, the price has been paid, the debt we owe has been covered, it's been taken care of. It is finished. It is finished. As I draw my last breath, my earthly ministry is finished. I've done what the Father has called me to do. And because I have been obedient even to the point of death, now death will no longer have any hold upon my followers. Sin will no longer have the final say or the final victory. It is finished. And then these last words that we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. Now it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. For the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and they went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So these very last words of Jesus from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, I believe each one of us is endowed with the spirit of God. We're told that God created us in his image. He formed us of the dust of the earth. And then we're told that he breathed into us the very breath of life. I believe that is the very spirit of God. That is the thing that animates us. That is the thing that gives us life. And when that spirit is taken, when that spirit goes, we no longer live in this physical, earthly body. For all of us, we are going to experience that, save the Lord's return. But at some point, that spirit, that breath of life is going to leave us. And we commend that to God who gave it. But our soul, our being, it will live on. It will go to be with the Lord, and eventually there will be the day of resurrection. Exactly how that will be, what exactly our bodies will look like, I'm not 100% sure, but, but one day we too will resurrect, and the Lord will return, and he will call, and we're told that uh, the dead will rise first, and then those who are alive will meet them in the air. Because, you see, God has going to restore us. Just as Jesus gave up his spirit, we will give up our spirits and eventually they will be restored to us and we will live and breathe again in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus fulfilled all things and he gave up his spirit to God who gave it. These are the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Now, next week I plan to share with you what are the next words that Jesus spoke, the seven next words that Jesus spoke after he rose from the dead. Yes, he did rise on Easter day. They found the stone rolled away. They found the tomb was empty. The angels there said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is alive and he goes before you. And certainly he appeared to his disciples. He appeared to Mary there in the garden. And uh, over the next 40 days, he would appear time and again to his disciples and sometimes to a large gathering of people. And he spoke to them and he shared with them. We're going to be looking at these words. But right now we focus upon his sacrifice and his death for us. I hope that you know today that God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. See, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. These are the words from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17, that we know so well. And during this holy season, during this holy week, again, we were reminded of God's great love for us. You see, that person that died upon the cross was not just an ordinary person. As I mentioned earlier, I said he was an innocent man, a person without sin, hard for us to imagine that, tempted as we are yet without sin. That person became the perfect sacrifice. Now this week, many Jewish people will be celebrating Passover when they remember how the angel of death came to take the firstborn. But they had been told to sacrifice a lamb, a year old lamb, a lamb without blemish, to take its blood and to place it over their door, over the top and over the sides of their door. I've heard someone say, if you did that, you would notice that the blood would drip down and it would make the form of a cross. The lamb would be slain so that the angel of death might pass over. Well, now the perfect lamb came, Jesus, the very son of God. He lived among us, he taught, he healed, he shared, and yet he was without sin. And ultimately, he gave his life for us upon the cross. He could have sought out an easier way. He could have listened to the crowds on, on Palm Sunday when they were proclaiming him to, to be the king and just listened to them and maybe gone off someplace else and enjoyed this, this popularity, but that was not God's plan. God's plan was that he would die for us. He died for you so that you might be forgiven, so that you might have eternal life. So I pray that during this holy season, you won't let this time pass you by. If you've never said yes to him, may this be the time. If you've never uh, acknowledged that he is your Lord and Savior, may this be the time. If you never have allowed him to wash away your sins, to clean you, cleanse you, to give you the hope and the promise of eternal life, I pray that this is the time. Will you pray with me right now? Oh God, I thank you that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. It was not a pretty scene on that Friday. After he'd been flogged and after he'd been beaten and after they placed that crown of thorns on his head and then after they stripped him and nailed him upon that cross and hung him there and yet he continued to love us. He sought to forgive us. He showed compassion to us. He obediently offered his life so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be made whole. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. And again, I pray if there's one person who's watching this, um, who hasn't said yes to you, that this would be the moment, that this would be the time, that they would say, that man who died on the cross, he died for me. That man who died on the cross took my sins upon him. That man who died upon the cross paid a debt that I couldn't pay so that I might be forgiven, so that I might be a new creation, so that I might have eternal life. God, I say yes to him. Renew all of us, I pray, as we again experience this holy time. Prepare our hearts for the wonder and for the glory of Easter when we proclaim he is risen. He is risen indeed. Again, we give you thanks and praise and ask you to walk with us during these difficult days, uh, this time of this coronavirus, uh, that, Lord, you would keep us safe, that you would guard our steps, and that soon... Uh, this death would be alleviated and pass by us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God's blessing and God's peace be upon you. Amen.